And, and speaking about neurons, Kobe, did you, um, are you doing much? Actually, I don't know much about your background, actually. Are you doing much in the line of neuroscience and trying to do anything about bringing those kinds of thoughts together? I've taken a, a few neurobiology classes. It, it's always the case that it doesn't stick very well for me. You know, it, it's such precise semantic detail that it, it's often in one ear or the other. But I, I'm, I'm certainly interested in some like broader reconciliation of philosophical conceptual foraging, forage, foraging and foraging, as well as like an evolutionary, more ontic picture of um, time like what we would normally refer to as a scientific view, how that catches out in terms of like neurobiology has become less interesting to me. I, I actually, I rail against this notion that we can capture our lives, things like depression in terms of serotonin imbalances. Mm -hmm. So I've become quite, <laughs> um, well, what's the word? When you have antipathy towards something, antipathic towards it, but why is that an important thing for you? A little bit, but um, I, you know, sometimes I got to catch up on the words. So the antipathy, so um, that that's similar to ant antithetical. You mean? I'm not. I, that was the only word I didn't catch. Yeah, sort of um, a distaste, hmm. a distaste. This psychiatrizing and psychologizing of humans strikes me as sacrilegious, frankly. Wow! Yeah, that's pretty. That's a pre that's pretty strong. That's yeah. strong. So let me let me share where I think this would. Um, I'm excited actually because um, I see a very uh, opposite approach, and I think um, I'm I'm very uh, bullish. I'll use an economic term for instance, and I don't know if it has anything to do with it, but. My, the way I frame it with um, biology and with neuroscience is that I'm very excited about bringing those two worlds together. Now, um, we share a common interest with Professor Tubinek, and the one of the first times I believe I met uh, Stephen was in his uh, class, and so I've had the the, the opportunity to attend. Uh, one of his first year philosophy courses, and then our not courses, but just sit in on a class. And then also one of his 400 level courses, and it was uh, on, on Marx or something to that effect. Now, um, he, uh, he allowed me to step up in front of the group and uh, give an announcement about, um, uh, about a book that I was trying that I was studying. And I wanted to and I wanted to bring some of the people from his class into that conversation. In fact, that book is actually sitting on my desk here. Uh, I haven't really picked it up since then. It's actually a book by Robert Sapolsky, uh, Behave. And Robert Sapolsky's got a fairly um, prominent place on, on the internet as an uh, endocrinologist and a primatologist. And he studied baboons and, you know, he's, uh, I think, the recipient of a, you know, an, an Einstein award or something like this. Right. So anyway, so he's somebody that I, I look up to, but I see this as more of a problem with the field uh, rather than with the epistemology. OK. And so if I could explain that, um, I think the reduction tendency to take how the field explains biology um, as uh, maybe a starting point that can be really elaborated on um, from a, a romantic sense in a way, right? Like I run into this issue with, um, like today I had a podcast with um, a, a fellow, an Orthodox, an Orthodox Jewish man, and we're doing a series on suffering. And so there's a there's a real strong push towards God, and that that the the explanation really comes into that narrative structure, right? And the response philosophically is very much you can't explain it away with um, 
a reductionist scientific approach. And I'm like, whoa, stop for a minute. That we, we're only accepting that that the scientific approach is, redu- I find it um, wondrous, amazing. I find it uh, limitless in its potential, uh, you know, of wonder, right? So there's a, there's a magic if, you know, we want to call it mysticism that I associate with the scientific body of knowledge. I'm saying that's where we should be directed and not dismissive in terms of, you know, what we're seeing in the, in the, in the scientific body of knowledge in neuroscience in particular. Um, so you'll see me use terms like, you know, myelinating or, or um, uh, spindles and regenerative sort of these kinds of concepts that I see uh, are descriptive in how the brain functions and trying to apply it to conceptualizations of, of, uh, of um, conceptualizations of concepts, mm-hmm. right? That's why redundancy, you know what I'm, if you know what I'm referring to. Yeah, yeah, pulling the reduction up into a richer level of analysis. It has the yeah. vestiges of alchemical magic on it. I, I, I also share your optimism with regard to like the reappropriation of empirical concepts. I, I think I, my worry is the same I have with technology, which I essentially just got from Heidegger, which is, you know, we, it's easy to assume that our scientific and neurobiological epistemologies are just tools at hand, but really they induce us to think in certain ways. And so it's possible, I, I believe, to have your wondrous um, gestalt apprehension of the whole thing that it has this integrative and like rich dimension to it. I suspect that it's easy to lose track of it. And that a lot of people who set out to, to, to use neurochemistry as this gate into wonder find themselves like curbed by the methodology, which, you know, might border on paranoid, but I'm afraid it's a suspicion I can't quite shake. I applaud that. Kobe, that was brilliant. I mean, that it gave me chills. That's a really amazing. No, I'm serious. That is a really amazing response. Uh, you know, if this is going to be any indication about our our conversations into the future, that that's <laughs> about. No, I'm serious. Like that because that 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 encapsulates. Uh, I think the most accurate response. I, one of the things that happens is I was I was in conversation with a. Um, a Muslim fellow, right? And so I have no problem talking about the Muslim faith and uh, this particular individual's um, view of the Muslim faith and how he orients his life and how he frames reality. Mm. Uh, I, I have, I think in my age, I'm growing, well, I'm, I'm growing as a person. And because the idea is, is that my, ability to understand different perspectives is actually um, is, is making me a, a, a more well-rounded and, 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 and rich thinker, right? And so when I was speaking with this particular fellow, we came to commonality very quickly and realized that even from a secular standpoint and uh, from a Muslim faith, metaphysical standpoint, we can say a lot of the same things. There's much more commonality than, uh, than one would guess. Now, of course, I did challenge him on some ridiculous things like female genital mutilation and all these kinds of things, the standard lines from the atheist crew. But um, it was, I think, moving past that, not accepting that or condoning it. And I, re- I realized that there is an element of a relativism there. Um, I, 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 I did move to a place where I thought, you know, if I was in a position of trying to advise him somewhat like a teacher or a PhD advisor, something like that, as I would say, I'd advise you like this to kind of shore up your position. Like this is the argument that I would, I think would be the best argument for for the public discourse, right? Is that too like? Is that too presumptive to do something like that? 
Perhaps that's, I mean, my familiarity with this training is minimal. I'm in terms of the broader course of our conversation, are you drawing a certain parallel between like Islamic religious discourse and um, like social scientific discourse in terms of psychology and neurobiology? Is, is there a sort of um, isomorphism between these two ways that can be correct, but can easily be miscalibrated? In, uh, in ways, of course. No, I'm not, in this case, I'm going to be going against what I'm going to actually skip past the scientific tradition and go straight to Plato. So um, uh, something, yeah, something I'm really revealing is that I'm not afraid to say that I'm a, a Platonist. And, uh, you know, so I'm always stuck in the top floor of the elevator, right? And, uh, you know, it's weird because I'm afraid of heights, so I don't know what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Just for reference, the... um. Uh, our, our teacher, Dr. Talbanek, uh, uses this metaphor of um, the history of Western philosophy as going from Plato at the top floor to Nietzsche at the bottom. And presumably we've now exited and are walking around in broad, day broad daylight. We realize we've come from a high rise, not a cave, and are very confused about the whole thing. I love it. I love it. <laughs> this this week, um, I, I, I emailed Stephen and I said, please, was this your reference? Because I want to get the attribution right. Because the elevator metaphor, I think, is, is, uh, is, is, is quite amazing. and. Uh, uh, I, I know he's prompted me as as the as as the brilliant teacher that he is. Uh, he, I said to him something about Plato, and I think he was trying to urge me on beyond Plato. It's like, okay, enough with Plato. You should read. <laughs> mm. But I think I'm afraid it's entrenched me even more. And uh, so, to, you know, to come back to your point, and then maybe we'll move on to the elevator conversation. Is um, and I think it's going to be a reoccurring piece i just I, I you know it's it's either i need some dramatic intervention to pull me away from a platonic <laughs> ideal is, but you know but um uh you know that's that's going to be i think rather difficult to do um the reason why i came to some sort of commonality with the muslim thinker is because of uh moving towards an ideal Right, I know the danger in that and the idealism that history has uh, suffered through, but um, I think it's this Hellenic origin. No, it's not even Hellenic. It's like it's um, it's a classic Greece origin story, right? With with Plato on on forward, or sorry, with Plato and Socrates on forward. That is the point where we have this abstraction through uh, a proof through abstraction. Mm. And, and that's something with uh, an impregnated, you know, and that I use that illusion in, in a couple sense, like the, you know, the metaphor of uh, the birthing process and a midwife and all this kind of stuff. But we've got this impregnated ethic in it with the goodness in itself. Now, rather than embrace, rather than run from that, as some sort of absolute universal truth, I choose to, and choose, I'm going to use very loosely here, but I embrace it because um, I think it's, it's pointing to that apex of perfected perfectibility that we have an ability to orient ourselves uh, proximally and distal, which would be individually and pluralistically, like group wise, um, through time in, in a direction that is ultimately good. And I think that I could say we have an intuitive sense for that, but I'm digging myself a big hole with that. You know, you know where I'm going with this now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, one, one wonders if that's a function of like our reductive perceptive capacities where we have to, where, you know, to what degree is this like an evolutionary function of us being able to um, abstract generalities and certain static goals? And what, to what degree is this the conceptual movement of Plato that has come to like structure or thinking? you know, like the, like the trunk of the conceptual tree that we inhabit. Mm. Uh, I am <laughs> one of my favorite teachers, one over the internet whom I never met, uh, John Berveke talks often about never getting over Plato of going back and wrestling with him. So I, I'm sure there's no end to the fecundity of this particular topic. I from what little I know, I hear strong reverberations of Christianity um, in your rendition of this sort of ontology of, of ethics. 
I've been very influenced lately by Ayn Rand and by Nietzsche. I actually started reading uh, for a director to, reading with Tabanek, uh, Nietzsche's late writings mm. um, from his notebooks. And a, a version of the concern is that when we abstract out this ideal good and this ideal virtue, we set ourselves like over and against it. And we subject ourselves to it. And my own like folk diagnosis of the modern culture is this lack of our capacity to inhabit ourselves. And the, the disjunction we experience when we try to cognitively grasp our externalized ideals simultaneously pushes us away from life. And uh, perhaps it's a way to characterize Nietzsche's um, antithetical relationship to, to Plato, where, you know, on the, for the latter, there is this ultimate abstraction. And for the former, there is this return to the body and this return to fully inhabiting. And my suspicion is that the, like the spontaneous and frankly, like more sexual, <laughs> Um, like Nietzschean philosophy, I think it is at least a, a mode of inhabiting the world that we, we could benefit from. And I don't know how long, like hammering our heads against platonic philosophy, like Jordan Peterson does is going to actually be of assistance. I mean, that's oh, not, man, you but. put, you put, you put JC, I mean, JP. <laughs> yeah, it's just such an easy like question. Have, yeah. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to distance myself from Christianity. I really do because it's 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 something that happened after Plato, mm. right? And and so, you know, uh, Jordan Peterson's um, a, a apologetic, right? Basically, like New Age Christianity and don't throw away the the foundations of our culture. I think <laughs> bullshit, right? So I, <laughs> I think you know what? Let's 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 go back to the Greeks now. Okay, let's find where our commonality is here for a minute, right? Like, um, I do, uh, I I do go back to the pre-Socratics, and I have sympathy for Nietzsche and that in that regard. But um, I guess I'm still romantic with the fact that we have an intellectual hero as opposed to Achilles, right? Mm -hmm. And so. This is kind of the concept is that even the very existence of someone like Professor Tubinek, who's an intellectual hero to me as well. He says, like, I don't want that. I don't want that. OK, fair enough. But <laughs> the fact is, is that posthumously, no, seriously, posthumously, you're going to get that whether you want it or not. Right. Yeah. I mean, and to what degree history will remember you is, you know, that's that's not up for you to decide, really. Right now, you can act and inhabit and move in the direction of life that you feel that you want. But the only way you can purposely trying to avoid that inevitability is to live in a cave, right? Like completely segregate yourself from, you know, and if that's the case, you know, what, why, why affect other people in terms of intellectual thought, right? Because you, by his very existence and his very presence, right? His, and, and the resonating that he is amplifying, right? Okay, so we get into Heideggerian sort of concepts, right? I'm saying he's doing that. He's, he, he's, um, he's becoming a intellectual hero for us, right? And so it's not a Christina Aguilera. It's not a, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not like, a, you know, some other false idol sort of thing to use you know, some sort of Christian terms or anything like that. I, it's, it's, he's truly an intellectual hero from the, from the, the way he's approaching a love of literature and a love of intellect and philosophy. I think that's, that's, that is in the tradition. It's unavoidable. He's in, he's inhabiting that tradition. Right. So, and so yeah. What's the connection there that, that Plato, um, occupies a similar, if much greater pedestal, and that there is a like functional value or utility to being such a creative wellspring in a like a pedagogical sense? Well, I think the pedestal needs to be smashed. 
right? But it doesn't mean that the value of the, the value of Plato's thoughts um, are are not are not equally valid. It, I think there's I think there's a there's a tendency for um, our intellectual pursuits to you know try and pull people down and rip them apart, become something new, prove them wrong, this kind of thing, right? And yeah, wouldn't it be great if there was a philosophy that completely obliterated Plato's influence? Wow, that would be really interesting. It's like I go to, I go, to, I, and it's, it may seem simple, but I go to, you know, Tubinek and I say, look, it's, unesca- it's inescapable for me. I've got this idea, but you're going to tell me that that's my problem. So th- the very interaction that we're talking about is, we all need to leave that venue. We all need to do something physical and doing and acting and sexual. I love that that way you weave that in, that natural activity, right? Weave that natural activity into our lives and leave behind these shackles of rational uh, intellectualizing, right? Leave those behind. Leave this idealization concepts in the past. Leave it in a ancient Greek civilization that, hey, let's just agree they did it well. Let's agree that they took perfectible perfectibility and as a civilization, they had to have their shit together, right? I Let's leave it there, right? But to fully, in my opinion, to fully detach from an ideal or conceptualize something as what's the best way to formulate or polish your idea, right? It, it's, it, as long as you're intellectualizing it, there's footnotes to Plato. I just don't, I just, I, I, it's unavoidable. I can't get out of that loop. Yeah. Yeah. That's much more uh, generous than my previous rant. Um, to lay like some of my intellectual cards on the table, and I don't have very many, so this is a precious gesture. Uh, one of the and going and harkening back a little bit to our discussion on uh, neurophysiology, one of the most primary influences on my thinking has been a Scottish psychiatrist and philosopher named Ian McGilchrist. Does that name ring any bells? No, nope, but I'd love to learn more. <laughs> he, yeah, luminous, a truly luminous figure. He, he's one of those interesting people who the thrust of his thinking doesn't have to be correct to be true. Like it's so beautiful and interesting that to me, like to what degree he operates on biological facticity is almost irrelevant, but the the basis of his thinking is a uh, bicameral account of our hemispherical specialization, right? You know, we have two hemispheres. It's kind of weird. It seems like we have one being, What's the purpose of the two hemispheres? He identifies those with modes of attention where he sort of believes that all the functions are, are largely shared, but the, the ways in which they are executed vary in important and subtle ways. And in his conception, there's a, a primacy to the right hemispherical mode of attention, which is imp- supplemented by the left and that the two exist in interdependence, but have to sort of start and terminate in the, in the right. And the, the, the details that I think make this salient, at the very least, metaphorically, is that there are perceptual and peripheral and poetic and metaphorical modes of cognition, like with which we enter life and from which we draw the, the vision of art. And then there are mechanized and discursive and propositional processes that we can operate on the original vision. But in order for the the disassembly and manipulation of concepts to become meaningful and corporeal again, they have to be reuptaken into the first and primordial mode of attention. And the way in which I would use that to comprehend Plato is, is, and again, <laughs> to what degree I'm actually talking about 
Plato here is very suspect. But in terms of the the r- instinct of rationalization and conceptualization, Nagulkra says that the emissary has mistaken himself for the master. And so we lose track of the, the primordial mode of attention. Mm. And we believe that our rationalized conceptual schema is the reality. You know, so we, we mistake our our scales for music, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's a really good thing. Let me see if I can shore up the argument at Gates against, uh, you know, platonic thought. It, it just kind of occurred to me, and this is, you know, part of the... Sorry, if know, I make this quickly. Yeah. That's, that's far from an argument against it. I, I think this is a, a way to buttress it by, by understanding its context. You know, mm-hmm. it's not an argument against the yeah. stomach to say that it's not the brain or not the head. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. But, but please. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, to, to, okay. So to say that, that, that thinking is described entirely uh, and immutably as a movement towards a, an ideal, uh, I realize is like, it's, it's a, uh, erroneous right on its face like it just okay so the 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 concept here is that there's uh, um we're a eusocial species so we're relational in our in our interactions uh oh social uh, conquest yeah you mentioned that in class (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. oh we're gonna have so much fun with eo wilson he's one of my faves (laughs) but we, we are we are a social species and you know, as as we're working together, okay, um, or groups of people are working together, we don't, we, the the moment to moment interaction doesn't go through the thought process of perfected ideal perfectibility, right? These kinds of things. It's coming together in response and movement, and you know this kind of thing, right? So there's a bit of a different. Uh, description that you would use rather than a perfected or movement towards an ideal, right? There's there's the, the psychologizing of moving towards something perfect, right? So I get that. And so that I think would be, you know, worthy of flushing out, describing, but again, you're moving into an intellectual description of it. You're moving it, you're intellectualizing, you're participating in uh, a rational form of of self and group expression, okay? And so, you know, what is that balance of doing versus inhabiting, um, rationalizing? And I think that they're all potential tools for us to work with. Take this interaction, for example. Um, You and I could uh, meet at a coffee shop if it wasn't, if we weren't in the, you know, just post pandemic or kind of, nearing towards that 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 position in 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 time and we could have a very interesting conversation about philosophy just running into each other not knowing each other and having the conversation and then dispersing okay no equity into the future no potential for any other kind of leveraged intellectual manipulative anything we just in and out just Mm -hmm. this type of thing right and so you know you know, what does that say about how we would, fu- the reality is we don't function that way. And if we want to talk about a philosophy of doing, what we're actually doing here is doing something that is reifying, doing something, acting, making something that is more concrete, right? And so I'm saying, how do I combat a, like the, the limits of, of, of rationalizing our intellect, I'm saying, well, let's put it out there and make it so that it's, uh, we'll just throw it out into the world, do something with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. There's a fantastic irony. I think you're picking up on, which is that <laughs> as soon as we move, what might be in a somewhat vulgar way called like critiques of, discursive thought into language we've already sinned in the very way we're moralizing against and there's a hilarious irony in that (laughs) which is so amusing right like here let me let me effusively 
try to show you how we're lost in, in conceptual thinking. And in order to do so, let me fully employ my conceptual toolkit and get increasingly lost in the language. Well, okay. Look, this series, yes, exactly. So now, now you know, Robert Hanna may not approve of this, right? And I'm being, <laughs> Sorry, look, I don't know if he is. It's just, he's, he's a bit of an intellectual giant. And mm. uh, I, you know, he's, he's so thorough in his writing that uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to pick a fight, right? But the, 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 the philosophical definitions that he's putting forward, he's saying begins with the concept, right? It begins with the concept. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm like, okay, so this sounds awful lot like an idea. The idea is a concept. It's an idea. It's a, and so I'm like, and I'm coming back to Plato here. Now he's a radical Kantian. So I get this. And there's a whole mm -hmm. other tradition. It's much more complicated than that. But this series and, you know, we talked about trying to make this clips. It's like this continuous clip so far, right? We go back, we get like, you can't. So it's like, there's more compacted in this in terms of like a back and forth philosophical conversation than I would say I've had with almost any of my other guests. However, mm -hmm. I haven't really gone toe to toe on a philosophical conversation like this with somebody with as, if not more, interest in philosophy. So thank you, Kobe, for that. Um, the, the, the thing is, is that I think the conversation is going really well. The other thing is, is that the hope for this series, um, and it can be multiple series, it doesn't have to just be um, this one particular series. I know you're working on a series yourself. We could do a few other uh, projects. But this one, and, and, and we can tell by the background here, this is the theme background for uh, Hannah's project was, which is the philosophical descriptions, right? And so we now, as of this date, have four on the site. Uh, it starts with the concept in the introduction. He started off by defining continental philosophy. Then he went on to analytical philosophy. Uh, oh, anarchism in the mind. So what a great, yeah. So we've got, we've got, we've got anarchism, mind, continental philosophy, and uh, analytical philosophy. All with in the introduction, he's saying it begins with the concept, and so this is great. I think this is this is really good. Um, you know, I couldn't be happier for the contributions that that Hannah's working on, and uh, it's really quite amazing to tell you the truth. I get I get a couple emails a week from people saying, um, "Yeah, this is really cool. I like you know, I like what Hannah's doing," and you know, when's the series coming out kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So every time I give Scott a little subtle nudge and say, <laughs> well, Scott, <laughs> but he's working on it really hard. So he'll, he'll have something soon. He's, I think he's rather a perfectionist a bit, right? Likes to mm -hmm. have things just, and, and, uh, that's admirable. I think it's a little platonic. <laughs> mm. Yeah. He's not going to like that, right? But uh, you know, like you know, it, it, it's it's now it's a bit of a perversion, right? Is is to say it has to be too perfect, right? And uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Although Scott's remarkable, he he has a yes, um, yeah, he a is lubricated good. brain. It's very fun to like watch him sort of ponder back when we had the Adiger lectures, and then. Yeah. At around like the hour mark, just throw down some incredibly like dense and artistic observation slash question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think um, I'm I'm really excited to see how uh, you know Stephen and 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 Scott work together because uh, he's given me a little bit of a preview that it's uh, a preview that you know there's a little bit of laughter going on and it's a really engaged conversation. So I love that because that's exactly you know, what you can't script, right? Like if you, if, if you said, here's the series of questions that I want to ask you on a, on a show, it's like, okay, great. But I mean, you know, like, yeah, you want to have somebody that can kind of really, you know, ha have a partner, you know, in, in a conversation. Be human is a, is a vague, but I think powerful way to capture it. I'm um, jumping back to the 
displeasure we might receive from Robert Hanna, Dr. Robert Hanna, if he ever catches word of our just trash talking concepts in the first episode. Of <laughs> no, 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 I'm not trash talking, but okay, we're going with that, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's, and perhaps in contradiction to the ground we just traversed, there is certainly a like a beauty and utility in in a- arriving at a crystallization of a notion if if only to open up the the next movement in its becoming and, and you know the the beauty of that process shouldn't necessarily be conflated with like it's it's pathological capacity to become static and dead and i mean that doesn't regard in hannah's work is not what i can make in fact i don't know if i'm capable of making that about any person (laughs) including myself but are you referring on a simple level to say you know combating a way to stay away from you know dogmatizing something right making it too um static and orthodox you know like is that is that what you're referring to is that are do those do those fit is that is that are those concepts that fit what you're trying to describe yeah partially i mean i'd go for a more like gustatorial metaphor of um kind of like stale mm. or or bland or concretized in in a in an inflexible way because you know thinking thinking to me at any rate feels much less like you know coloring between the lines than it does like dancing yeah 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 well you have to have you have to have an appropriate dance partner to dance right um and then the the key would be that if you don't have a an appropriate dance partner then uh you know the ideal would be a teacher student relationship right that you're um and does society uh do do we have a kind of society that promotes a humility in front of other people it seems like we have competitive kinds of turn taking when it comes to thinking i don't think we're doing that here today right <laughs> a little no, bit honestly sure. like, well, it's never- no but i'm not trying to win something right mm-hmm. it's like there's mm-hmm. nothing what i'm what i'm uh, I, I think maybe if we're being honest, there's a bit of a validation act going on that we're able to express an idea with somebody that can hear what we're actually saying. And that's incredibly value because, valuable because this hearing, this, this um, you hear what I'm saying and you understand what I'm saying. And uh, not just from an empty cathartic sort of standpoint, although it is cathartic, it is validating, feels really good. But if it's if it's something that um, uh, if if you can recognize the truth functioning as I'm speaking, as you can see that that's happening, right? If you can see that, um, then and there could be a bit of a gustatorial sort of like um, like felt experience. And now I'm referring to a body of work that would be consciousness as described by somebody like Antonio Damasio, who is again a neuroscientist, the value of why I advocate for these kinds of things, because the biological substrate and correlation between a philosophical knowledge and what we're learning to be true from a biological standpoint, not approaching it from a dismissive reductive uh, standpoint, but integrating it into a deeply philosophical mind is enriching and i think it moves it moves the to use your other uh reference your 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 left side along with your right side right in a cadence yeah. right and that's that's the point that i'm trying to look at is this counterpointing moving forward of 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 um tiny little hypothesis, right? Like if I have a book, I approach it, I think, well, what's this author going to be doing? What do I know about this? You know, what's the context of this? What's the importance of this historically? Okay, let me see what I can do with this. And then 
compare it against, you know, where my worldview is, right? And do I come out conflicted or do I come out going, all right, this aligns, this makes sense, I can see, you know, this kind of thing. That's how I approach it. Mm -hmm. I, I like the comment about really listening. It, one of the most painful experiences for me socially is watching people ostensibly listening to other people, but just biding their time to speak, you know? And it's, it's so, so easy to do. It's like, oh, oh, Daniel said this thing two minutes ago. So I can cling on to that and wait and self-consciously until the moment arises. And so at, at this stage of the conversation, I don't really, I, I'm not able to fully draw out the um, semantic links, but uh, I, I, I think perhaps another angle on the, the, the movement of the conversation um, in terms, in, in terms of the, the balance of being and becoming and conceptualization and, and movement is there's a, you know, as you say, you, you pick up a book and there's this, this sort of central gravitational point that directs the movements of the book. And there is this approximation of a good or a true as we, as we come to crystallize the concept. And it seems like that's a step in the movements of thinking. But it's a, it's a creative destruction. And so in, in a sense, the, the, the approximation just, of the ideal. Did you just say a creative destruction? Yeah. Wow, that was a wonderful, wonderful word weld. Please do continue. Sorry for that interruption. I hope I didn't buck you off your thought. Oh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm always just like holding the reins as I'm dragged through the dirt anyway, so it's, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, Schumpeter always comes to mind, the little bit I know of, of Mr. Joseph. But um, yeah, there, so, so the, the platonic, platonic, instinct to make clear in a sense almost sets up the next stage of the criticality the, the John Ravakey fellow he has this nice analogy of um, like a pile of sand where as you pour more sand on the pile it'll reach a certain point where all of a sudden it crumbles down again and the, the deconstruction of the previous zenith looks like destruction but really it's, it's the like reintegration of that peak into the foundation of the next. Mm. And so perhaps we can harbor our instinct towards conceptualization by, by noticing that it's a, an important sort of sub fact of the becoming that makes for like stable conceptual movements, but that we, we would be, misapprehending reality to think that when we've reached one stable peak in our sand pile, we've kind of reached the, the true and the good and the beautiful and the mm -hmm. realm of ideas. Wow. That was nice. Yeah. Which is something I would say against Kant as well. I mean, perhaps um, Dr. Hannah would be able to thrash me <laughs> and God, I hope, but um, I, I see, I really see Kant as being the inverse of Plato. Uh, okay. In a simpler way than Nietzsche, at any rate, and huh. and both both seem to terminate in this. Here, here we are at this like absolute point of being, and and both of those I think are subject to the same criticism of. Well, you've just reached a point of criticality and don't recognize the the dynamic step, the fact that we've never reached the end. You know, there's no like end of history. Sorry, Fukuyama. <laughs> I like the idea. <laughs> Uh, okay. So let me, so let's, let's say that there was, um, so we're saying opposite antithetical to, uh, Plato. And if my tendency appears to be platonic, um, I'm curious, uh, other than the fact that we're intellectualizing and rationally, you know, with our rational minds here, what would be the, you know, what would be the, the Nietzschean or Kantian move, if we're trying to move a conversation or 
uh, you know, develop it. And I mean, in tandem, this, this sort of thing, what, what's the next move, you know, for us in that sort of bottom floor of the elevator, so to speak, you know, with Plato on the top, what's, what's that next move? Yeah. If we're doing it from a Kant standpoint or from a, a Nietzsche Nietzsche standpoint. One thing I want to pick up is a, is a, a little um, word I picked up from, again, Verveke. This is a name I'll probably be saying a lot. Um, you know, dialogue, dialogical, and the notion that the mode of cognition that happens between people who become aware that they are navigating like some sort of logic, some sort of logos is a, I don't know, a remarkable and beautiful thing to reflect upon. Regarding the next step, I mean, I think the only thing that I could say that might be interesting, or at least all that comes to mind immediately, is is to remember that we we are not the ones who are actually doing this. I, I think mm. it's, it's better to consider ourselves sort of stewards of the clearing, in Heidegger's words, to 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 be opening this space of insight, but but not to mistake ourselves for the creative ground. Because like we are always just witnessing. And so the notion that that we can reach out into that next stage of thinking and pull it into existence is uh I just think like a misapprehension of reality. You know, because whenever I have a creative insight, and I like to think I have at least some number at some points, um, it certainly does not feel like I'm doing it, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like one of the gods sort of knocks on my attention and says, hey, hey, here's just a glimpse of something salient. And then, then I can configure myself into an opening for it where it can sort of flow through me. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I'm, I'm only the architect of the aftermath. <laughs> oh, sorry, I do like that one. <laughs> okay, I have a, I have a. Okay, so I want to spend some time on uh, what do you think? I love that word stewards, and and I I I doubt that uh, that that uh, Martin Heidegger would use the word steward because of the, you know, it's 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 like a steward of the planet kind of thing, right? Interesting, mm -hmm. right? But I like that, and I know you're an Neil Wilson guy. So what I'm curious about is that say we named this 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 show this series and stewards stewards of clearing and so that's not correct grammar really but I'm wondering can we flush it out like I like the pairing of that like stewards of clearing you know what do you think about that idea for a name yeah I actually like we're witnessing that and we're tending to it but Mm. The I'm thinking of titling for the video series, which I'm hoping to do for one more or less dubious reason. Um, is the the Jesus Christ tentative really? title for the, <laughs> tentative title for the introduction is clearing the clearing. I'm okay. okay. W one concern is that. I never know how normal people think, you know, people who are sane enough not to devote a significant portion of their time to studying the thoughts of madmen in excruciating detail. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm never sure how accessible it is because I, I read, you know, um, stewards of the clearing and I'm like, Oh, I know pretty well what that means. I wonder if most people will read that and be like, man. <laughs> yeah. You guys must be so baked, which is also true. I, you know, periodically. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh shit! Um, I, I, I love the direction, though. Um, and, yeah, and yeah, I yeah. certainly assent to that um, title. It's 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 at the very least beautiful. Yeah, it is. You know, I mean, I you know, it, I keep coming back to Heidegger too. Uh, Nietzsche for me is a perversion. I, he's like a Duchamp on a wall, and I know that I kind of might get, you know, frowned upon for that. But you know, I mean, I just I can't help it. Uh, and perversion in a sense that I think of Edgar Allan Poe. You know, it's like. It's not that he's not valid. It's not that he's not a contributor. But if he's riding a bicycle and there's a, you know, there's a pothole in the road and you swerve for it, that's the perversion. It's like, fuck it. Let's see what happens if we go this way, right? So it's like it reminds us, right? You know, I get it. I get it, right? But 
I just, that's, that's, that's the heuristic that I use. And uh, that's to me what comes to mind when I think of perversion is I, I automatically think of Edgar riding his bike and swerving towards the pothole. Right. So, yeah. Um, but Heidegger is, it's Heidegger, you know, one of my intellectual heroes is, is, uh, is George Steiner. And he calls, uh, actually it may have been actually his, uh, his love affair, uh, Anna Herant, who uh, it was either Steiner or Herant or Herant that uh, Aaron that said the, the secret king of thought must have been must have been Steiner. I don't know if your if your lover would say that, <laughs> but the secret king of thought, and and I and I think it was Steiner that said history will remember Heidegger as being that the secret yes. king of thought. I I, I share that that belief. Perhaps for the wrong reasons, but Daniel, I'm sorry. I've actually I gotta get running here. I'm catching a flight tomorrow, and I'm not staying the night at my current house. So I gotta run to East Man and try to do logistics. Thank you. I am the lovely thing about these things is that it's it's intrinsically enjoyable, right? Yeah. And I appreciate it. And I appreciate you taking the time. You're awesome. We'll see you next week. Ciao, sir. Talk soon. Bye.